that's owned by AJ Online. I'm also the founder of the digital marketing group on LinkedIn, a group that's grown to over 120,000 members in the last couple of years. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking to you around how to build business through the social web, uh, how to use the social web to generate leads, um, how to use the web to be able to um, save money and um, generate uh, insights. So my first slide, uh, I think this kind of says it all at the moment, you know, it's vision of apocalypse now. The economy is completely trashed. Um, you know, it's uh, in a terrible situation as we know at the moment, and uh, I don't think we can really see you know the end of things. I think for sure, you know, it's certainly going to get a lot worse. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this index. Um, it's uh, it's basically called the misery index. I always thought we were a nation of happy, jolly people in the UK, but apparently now we've got a scale to tell us how darn miserable we are. In fact, we're the second most miserable nation on this graph. Joking apart, what it's actually measuring is um, unemployment figures versus inflation. So, you know, where does that leave us? You know, as business professionals, we've never been under so much pressure to think smarter and to be more accountable for managing our marketing spends and more, uh, more uh, <laughs> an attribute um, our return on investment. So I'm going to suggest, you know, it's not all doom and gloom and misery and that there's some solutions to be found here in the social web. So the first section that I'm going to talk about is crowdsourcing and uh, how we can use crowdsourcing to save money, to drive engagement with our customers and uh, how to build uh, groups of much more loyal customers to ultimately be able to make us money. So firstly, what is crowdsourcing? Crowdsourcing is really the coming together of groups or communities of people online to better solve challenges or problems. The idea is that uh, the wisdom of the crowd is greater than that of the individual. And um, by people working in groups collectively can solve problems faster uh, with much clearer and uh, better results than if you'd gone about it in a singular manner. So I'm going to firstly talk through an experience that I've had, uh, which is um, I basically crowdsourced the branding for a business that I was involved in called Green Advertising. I then went on to crowdsource the design of an entire website as well. So firstly, I came across this site, Design Crowd, but there's numerous sites like this out there. Uh, this is a community of 45,000 design professionals who basically engage in so solving design challenges you post to the site. So they'll do everything from creating business cards and stationery for you, logos, letterheads, t-shirts, and even through to trade stands you see at events like today. And you can do that for much less cost. So I'll just take you through some of the steps. So firstly, I posted a, a project that um, was basically about creating a logo in the first step as I wanted to develop an identity for my business. Um, I then selected the package that was right for me. Uh, the site tells me roughly how many designs I should be getting for the budget. And it also tells me roughly the number of designers that would actually be interested in a, a project like mine for the cost that I'm willing to pay. I then create a simple brief that outlines the task at hand and also talks about you know, what must be included. And uh, in my case, I didn't want people to go down some of the obvious routes with a name you know, such as green advertising. I kind of didn't really want flower power style logos. Uh, and uh, so again, you, you stipulate what you don't want and you obviously set a duration for the project. You then choose the type of logo or theme you're interested in. 
everything from word marks, emblems, pictorial type designs, and so on and so forth. You then specify um, using sliders the type of look and feel that you're after. I wanted something that was fairly youthful, um, something that wasn't so conservative, that was maybe a little bit more playful. And you can see you know, how I've kind of specified that on the sliders here. And then onto some of the results. So I got 73 designs from 33 designers at a cost of $170. So that's 100 pounds. Whereas, you know, the lowest quote that I could find was 500 pounds. And I know I'm gonna get a really tin pot job. I'm gonna get a, a couple of uh, very average designs back for my money. Um, and more sensible quotes were probably coming in around 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. Um, what it meant was that was <laughs> what it meant was that I got a design that I was happy with, and this was the the final logo, uh, and also got a set of icons that I could also use elsewhere that seemed very useful for me. I then went back to the same site and went through exactly the same exercise looking for a theme of my website. And again, I got 28 designs from seven different designers for $720, which is you know, incredible value for money. Uh, I think that's roughly 380 pounds. This was the final design that we came up with. It exceeded my expectations. And the total project cost was 480 pounds. The total of the cheapest quotes that would have got me a very average job, two grand. So I managed to bring that in for a quarter of the price with far more choice and the results that we needed as a business. Another example here is of a brand who's been engaged in crowdsourcing. So Fiat is the biggest car manufacturer in Brazil. They launched a uh, platform so they could crowdsource ideas from their customers and they had over 10,000 designs submitted or um, concepts submitted from people from 160 countries. People's suggestions included ideas around comfort, around style, around the size of the vehicle, uh, around environmental specifications and of course around entertainment options that are included within the car. What I particularly liked is how Fit used this exercise to further engage with their audience and uh, create a very loyal community of potential customers. So they created a channel on YouTube where they were releasing step by step every phase of the design process. So it was inclusive of the people who were putting their ideas forward. They also created a blog where they were, again, posting on a free, frequent basis, literally every couple of days, the new suggestions that they were taking on board and how they were incorporating those into the vehicle. And what that means for them is, you know, if this wasn't a concept car and it was uh, a vehicle that obviously was um, for the retail markets, that they already have an audience of people who participated in its development who are potentially interested in buying with their money in exchange for driving the car that they've had some input into. Uh, I also love the way that uh, this is a very much an open process, whereas normally when you would develop a, a vehicle or the design process in general, is something that normally happens behind closed doors, and it's kind of the finale, you know, when they come to release the vehicle, and then they have to put obviously a whole load of marketing budget behind that. And this is a much more cost-effective way of being able to create a product, uh, and a product that people want and people are engaged with. Next, um, whilst researching this presentation, I came across a site called Quirky. I thought it was amazing. Um, for as little as $10 a month, you can create an idea for a product, upload the product to the site, other people on the site can get involved in the design and the development of that product, and, um, and evolve it so it's ready for market. They've partnered with a retail network, including um, companies like Toys R Us or Amazon, 
Barnes & Noble uh, and a number of other um, retailers globally to be able to take these products and put them in the marketplace. Uh, what it's actually resulted in is these guys now putting out two products per week and um, their community has grown to over 45,000 members. Not only the people who've come up with the idea for the product to pay, but also people who've contributed to that idea and helped to evolve it to the stage that it's ready for market. Some of these people have earned tens of thousands of dollars over the last year. And this site is uh, Ideastorm. Um, I'm a big fan of Dell and especially what Dell's been doing within social media. Uh, they've created a site called Ideastorm for their customers to be able to make suggestions around their products, things that they should include, maybe things that they should remove from their products. Um, what's really great is that um, you submit your idea or your suggestion, other people in the community can vote it up or down, they can comment on it, and what it means is uh, a combination of, of the two of these things um, helps the best content float up to the, the top of the site where it becomes visible to Dell and it starts getting more attention. What I also really like about this is that they've created uh, an area of the site for Dell employees and they're calling them Dell Ideas Partners. And you know, normally a computer brand is something that would be deemed as fairly faceless. And they've actually given it you know, a, a humanity of sorts. I can connect to this guy here, Russell T. You know, Russell's got a biog, he's got a picture. You know, it starts making the, the company become a lot more human to me. Uh, and it helps me in terms of someone who's interested in participating with them. What this has meant for them is that they've had nearly 16,500 ideas that have been contributed and uh, about three quarters of a million ideas that have actually been voted on um, by the community. They've had just under 100,000 comments posted and that's resulted in 470 ideas that have actually been implemented into Dell's products to make them better. We have a huge community of people here that are engaged enough to participate in this manner who are their customer who are likely to buy these new products. So that's the end of the first session. The, the next session is around inbound marketing and advocacy marketing and how you can be using this to generate leads and opportunities and obviously awareness in your business. So these on the left are really the traditional marketing channels. Newspaper, radio, TV, direct mail, telemarketing, email. And they're typically expensive, uh, maybe inaccessible to a number of people in this room. Uh, they're also declining in terms of uh, the return that people are getting on investment. And um, they're notoriously hard to measure, uh, all except email really. I wouldn't say that people were to drop these channels, but they need to think about using them in a much more integrated sense in terms of what they're trying to achieve online. And this is supported by a survey that was conducted by Nielsen of 25,000 uh, internet users worldwide. And people were saying that 90% uh, of the time they will go on a recommendation from a friend or somebody that they know whilst trying to make uh, a decision around you know, a purchase. What I found really interesting was that 70% of the time, people also trust recommendations whilst researching their purchasing decision that others have left online. And you know, these are the total strangers, but there's a significant level of trust. I then decided to look to see how a decision was made for a slightly higher value product in a concept of business. And uh, Hillen Knowlton did a survey of IT decision makers and they found that 58% of the time people were going on personal experience and 51% uh, of the time they would be going on analyst reports and third party content followed by uh, word of mouth. What this does highlight is that there's a distrust of advertising and direct marketing, and they felt that these were the least important sources of information whilst making a high value purchasing decision. 
just a very simple an example of you know where you can see this at play is on Twitter. So I searched for where the best places to eat were or the best places to stay, and you can see you know people are in dialogue with one another, asking the question, and other people are obviously making their recommendations. As I said earlier, I run the, the digital marketing group, 120,000 members, decided to do a survey with the group to find out what their objectives were for their social media strategy. And clearly, generating awareness was the number one driver. Uh, it had 127 votes, or 53% of the audience. And that was followed by driving traffic, 53 votes, or, or 22%. And that really concurred with a survey that um, eMarketer had produced. And they basically asked a US audience what the main reason for them implementing a social media strategy was. And the results came back, 61% was to increase lead generation. So, you know, lead generation really online is all around getting found. If people can't find you, um, you know, you might as well not exist, you're invisible. So how do you get found? You need to produce great content. Um, that can take forms of blogs or video, or white papers, ebooks perhaps, but content that's, you know, remarkable, that's worth commenting about, that people would want to share, that is useful to people. Then what do you do with the content? You need to get it out there, so you need to use social media. You can use channels like Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook and certainly the blogs to start getting your content out at a very, very low cost so that people start landing on it, so people start sharing it, and as you see on Twitter, so people start recommending it and sharing the links with others. You need to think about search engine optimization. Uh, you need to think about how you're going to optimize your content, the types of keywords that people are going to be looking for. Maybe those keywords relate to your type of business or the industry that you're within. You need to think in the context of both on your website, um, in terms of driving traffic through to you, but you also need to think about off of your site and what people are searching on on the social sites and why they want to land on your remarkable content and uh, make it available to people so that they'll start sharing it. This is a graph from uh, HubSpot that's a US company involved in inbound marketing. And they've basically proven that uh, companies that blog, companies that produce great content and that are practicing inbound marketing techniques have managed to reduce their cost of acquiring leads by 60% over those that are more reliant on traditional marketing channels. They also produced this survey, which was around companies that blog frequently. So companies that blog um, a numerous times per day could 100% attribute new customer acquisition and the capture of leads um, via the activity. Companies that are blogging daily, 90%. Companies that are blogging two to three times a week, they're at 69%. More so, companies that blog um, have 97% more links coming in to their websites than companies that don't. They also have 434% more pages indexed in Google than companies that don't. So I'm suggesting, you know, if you're blogging, you are more likely to come up over your competitors that are not within the search engines, especially for your industry terms, as your content is being indexed. Uh, and even more so now that Google's algorithms have changed recently, and there's a lot more attention to recency of the articles and the recency of the content that is being posted. I also thought this was uh, an interesting study, again from eMarketer, that showed that 21% of people who use Twitter in the US are following brands. And then you look at the number of brands that people are following. 21% of those are following 10 or more. You can see that 28% uh, that people are following three to four brands. So this is fairly significant, but I'll, the next slide will show you where it becomes more significant. 
So this is in terms of recommendations. So people who are following brands on Twitter are obviously more likely to start recommending them. But the under 35 bracket, it equates to roughly 60% of people who follow brands say they're likely to recommend them. And in the red bar here, at 14%, they're saying that they're likely to recommend many brands, while the black bar represents people who are likely to maybe recommend a few. It's interesting how that's flipped in the 35 to 49 age group, where 33% of people are saying they're likely to recommend many brands, and 14% are saying that they're likely to recommend a few. Again, a total of roughly 50% of people, if they're following you, are likely, at some point, to want to recommend your brand if you're providing them with useful, relevant and timely content. I myself um, work as an advocate and I've worked with uh, a number of brands. I also work with uh, white paper syndication companies in the US and I find content that's really useful and really relevant to my audience and I'll send it out. So this is a campaign that I did on behalf of Oracle and they were targeting IT, marketing and sales decision makers in the US and Canada at companies with 500 plus employees. I sent a message on their behalf with a link to a report to my audience up on LinkedIn. The results they got was that just over three, well, just over 3,000 people clicked on the link. They had uh, about 950 forms that were submitted and that resulted in just under a couple of hundred leads that were qualified to fall into their marketing process. Uh, you can imagine a, a company like Oracle obviously pays great money for a lead. Um, so that was a, a good day for me. Um, but even better days for these guys because you can imagine that the cost of their service and the cost of their product is extremely high. Uh, and you know, they, they only need one or not even one to convert from there to better see a very viable return on their investment. Uh, what that did for the group as well was fairly interesting. People started having conversations around that content. People started writing to me asking for basically, you know, do you have anything else like this? Do you have any other stuff that you can be sending out to us? And it really started providing a service to my audience. I mean, I'm not going to send out junk to people because it pays. I'm going to send out useful information because they can use it within their business. And, uh, you know, the appreciation, not just for my service, but um, the great sentiment towards Oracle's um, content and towards their brand was also shown in the group. And so really that's you know, why we decided to build a platform. So we've built a platform for uh, inbound marketing that we allow marketers to use. And we've also started recruiting a network of people like me who have huge audiences who will work on behalf of businesses to promote offers or to promote white papers and case studies and reports to generate leads and um, obviously to be able to save costs you know, for our, our customers. So our platform enables people, as I said, to capture inbound marketing leads, to be able to reach more people with the marketing message to be able to reduce um, a significant chunk of the identification process that um, would normally involve telemarketing or use of other expensive marketing channels. And um, we've built in a, a set of surveying tools so that people can generate you know, insights immediately from the marketplace and be able to measure the return on their investment. So, what I'm going to leave you with as part of the second part of this presentation is you know, work with advocates and have them do the heavy lifting and have them share you know, their love for your products and your services with their audiences that are completely aligned to your business's proposition uh, and whilst allowing you to get on with what you're great at and that's producing you know, meaningful and useful content that relates to your area of business. That, I think, is my half an hour. <laughs> Thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, quite happy to, to take a few. No 
No questions? Uh, okay, you can find uh, a copy of my presentation up on SlideShare. So just go to slideshare.com forward slash the digital marketing group. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is at John Horsley. I've just tweeted a moment ago. I've just tweeted the direct link to my presentation. Thank you.